The kindness of a king. Mercy we understand, right? Someone makes a mistake, we forgive them. It's called mercy. You perpetrate a crime against someone, go to court. The judge says, if you do this, you do that. You run through these hoops, you'll get a less, lesser sentence. You know what that is? That's mercy. That's a type of mercy. You might, um, have a, you might be at the store, you have a child kicking and screaming. Jordan, you won't have that quite yet, but after we prayed for you today, maybe shortly. <laughs> you have a child kicking and screaming. I've been, I, have heard, I have been there when it's happened, and I have, I have heard stories from my wife when I wasn't with her at the store, and our kids were younger, and it was not good. I would get a phone call about my kids, not her kids. <laughs> and the fact that she didn't just grab them by the neck, and throw them in the car was an act of great mercy. <laughs> this is mercy. We understand the concept of mercy. We really do. We don't always like it or agree with it, but we understand it. It's pretty easy to understand. James 2 says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Yes. God is a merciful God. His mercies are new every morning. Yeah. The fact that you got up this morning, got dressed, hopefully brushed your teeth, put on deodorant, drove here, are sitting in this seat, and breathing is an act of God's mercy. And he says, every morning, I'm going to give you new and fresh mercy. How many just are so grateful for the mercy of God? For you would not be here without his mercy. Mercy comes from a place of great compassion. Luke 18 tells us a story of a blind beggar who heard a commotion when he was sitting on the side of the road and the, uh, right in front of Jericho. There was a commotion of, of people and he figured out that it, Jesus was walking through the crowd and he had heard of Jesus and he knew that Jesus was the healer. And it says he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I've actually heard that in a service before. I've heard somebody scream out that, scream out in a service. It kind of sh shocked everybody. Like, Phew. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. So you know what happened? People tried to shush him. Shh, quiet. You're disrupting what's happening here. Be quiet. He, it made him even more agitated. So he said, louder, mercy. No, he, said, he didn't scream that. He screamed, Jesus, Son of David. Have mercy on me. And the Bible says he just kept yelling it until, guess what? Jesus finally comes over. Sometimes we just got to keep on knocking on the door. He just kept yelling, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped says, had the man brought to him and asked him a simple question. This is Jesus does this a lot. It's obvious what the guy wants. But sometimes Jesus wants you to actually say it. What do you want me to do for you? The man answered, Lord, I want to regain my sight. Guess what that means? He previously had sight. This was not someone born blind. He says, I want my sight back. Jesus, in a great act of compassion and mercy, looks him squarely in the face and says, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. The Bible says the man got so excited, he began to actually follow Jesus like he became a believer right then and there. Why? Because of the great compassion and mercy of a merciful king. Sometimes we think mercy and grace are the same thing, and they're in the same family, but they're not exactly the same thing. God doles out mercy and grace. If I simplified it, I was thinking about if I could simplify it for you, I would say <clears throat> forgiveness is an act of mercy. If I forgive you, I'm, that's an act of mercy. Although we're supposed to forgive, but it's a merciful thing to do. 
Salvation is a free gift of God's grace. That's why you can be forgiven and even ask for forgiveness. God, forgive me. And still not receive the salvation that comes with the grace of God because you reject, you could still reject salvation. You could still reject salvation and be forgiven. See what I'm saying? <clears throat> and so I want to talk to you this morning about grace. The grace of God. Without his grace, where would we be? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, now I'm found. Go ahead. Was blind, but now I see. Bam! Regained my sight. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have... I'm preaching this morning, by the way. I'm preaching. I got my preach on. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works. Works! So that no one may boast. Often, again, with mercy, mercy can be attributed to a work. Do this, do this, do that, do that. Your sentence will be lessened. That's not grace. My favorite definition of grace is the unmerited favor of God. That means favor without merit. You don't have to do anything to receive the grace of God. Lest you boast in your own works. That's why it's free. It's grace. I'm so glad for the grace and mercy of God. Unmerited favor. Favor without anything attached. You do nothing for grace except receive it. Because again, if it was works, then you could boast of it. Look what I did to receive salvation. Now some people still believe you have to go through a bunch of hoops to receive salvation. But that's not biblical. It's a gift. The only thing you have to do is receive it. And actually, it's faith partnering with grace that leads to salvation. There's an action there. Faith. Grace and faith. Grace is shown, obviously, in one of the great stories of the Bible. Why do I keep doing this to my voice? Keeps doing that. Going in and out a little bit. I know it's fine. No, it's not puberty. I hit that a couple years ago, Lee. I'm a late, I'm a late bloomer. Grace is shown in one of the greatest stories we have in the Bible, the story of the prodigal son. Great grace. The son says what? Give me my inheritance. I'm going to go to, a, basically he's like, I'm going to go to a foreign land, do what I want, when I want. I'm going to party all night. I'm going to spend my money. I'm going to sleep around. I'm going to make a mockery of our family name, and I'm going to burn every bridge in the process. And he does. Oh, but for the prayers of a loving father. Never underestimate the power of praying parents or grandparents. When the son got to the end of his rope and nearly the end of his life, he thought, if I could just go home and be like one of the servants, at least they have it better than I do. I'm not looking for sonship again. That ship has sailed. I've done too much wrong. I'm looking to just come home and be a servant. I know I messed up so bad that my father would never let me back into the house. But maybe if I can just be treated as a servant, I'll be okay. So the Bible says, as you know, he begins to walk home. And it was grace that placed him right back in good standing with his father. It was grace, the grace of God, when he didn't deserve it, the grace of a father. Romans 3, for all have sinned, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by what? His grace, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. There's literally, 
nothing more important in our lives today than the grace of God. Without it, salvation is earned, not given. And we'd be in a world of hurt without the grace, the amazing grace of God. How many of you can think about where you've come from and where you are today and can just rest knowing that is only by the grace of God that you are here today and you should be in a ditch somewhere? Grace restores you. I want to read a story about the kindness of a king. It's in 2 Samuel 9. I don't think I'm going to be long this morning because I'm flying through these notes. I'm going to take a break here and just tell a story, though. 2 Samuel 9. It's a great story about a couple people. It shows the character and heart of King David. And it shows... Well, it shows a lot of things, actually. We'll talk, we'll look at, but the story of, this, this name is hard to say. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it a few times, and I'm probably going to botch it. Mephibosheth. I got it. That was very, pretty good. First time. Let's just keep it there. Let's not say it again. Mephibosheth. Hey, what? I haven't done that all week. In my head, I've been like, Methuselah. No, it's Mephibosheth. Anyway, this is the great story about the grace and kindness of a king. So if you go back a little bit, we're going to jump into 2 Samuel 9 here in a moment. But if you go back, this is the, this is the story of, of a young boy at five years old who, when King Saul and Jonathan were killed in the battle of the Mount of Gilboa, and word started to spread through Israel that the king has been slain as has his son. Jonathan, everyone knew David was now king. He had been king over Judah, but now he was king over all the nation of Israel. I like saying it like that, Tony. I just like it. I don't know. Israel. Israel. And as would be custom, if you were in the king's family, that had just been killed or had been taken and was replaced by a new king, very often the new king would come in and destroy the family, kill them all. No bloodline left. We're in, there's a new sheriff in town, and you're out. And so knowing this, Mephibosheth, who was the son of Jonathan or the grandson of King Saul at five years old, it says his, his nurse picked him up and started to run and flee so they wouldn't be killed by the, by the, by the, the, new, uh, the men in the new king's service. They don't, whether they would have or not, they're assuming they would. So the Bible says as they're fleeing, depends on your translation, she drops the child and he becomes crippled. That's a pretty bad drop. I mean, that's like... I don't know if I've dropped, I probably dropped one of my kids here or there. I don't know. Have I? Have I dropped you? When? Yeah, right. I mean, I've, I think we've had kids fall off of the, um, what's that called when you, the diaper thing? Have we had a kid fall off? Changing table? All of a sudden, poof. So I was very uh, nervous about those kind of things. So. I would, uh, I wouldn't really turn my back very often. Must have been my wife that did it, because I don't think I would have done it. But I mean, maybe it was me. I don't. Know. I'm, I'm the guy though who would like put gloves on to change their dirty diapers when I was a new father because it's poop. And, and you did it too. Thank you. So you know, people would make fun of me. Uh, there was a time or two I might have even had a mask on, right? <laughs> But then that's the first child. By savvy, man, I was just like, what? I was wiping it on myself. I didn't care. It was like, no big deal. It's like, 
still need a shower. I would, I would, I would change their diapers and take a shower because I was just too close. Anyway, it knows me really well. Knows that's probably not a stretch, actually. <laughs> but she dropped the child so bad that he became a cripple for life. He wasn't able to walk, the Bible says. Or if he had to walk, he had to walk with crutches or cane of some sort. And so now we're going to pick it up. 20 years later, D David had been king now for 20 years. And we go to 2 Samuel 9, 1, it says this, Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? King David, 20 years, he's been doing this now. Saul's long gone. The memory of Saul is long gone. And David, I could just imagine he's just looks outside and all, the, all, of his, all of his land and over his people, and he goes, is there any one left from the evil king that tried to kill me? Is there anyone left in his family that I may show kindness to for the sake of my covenant friend, Jonathan? It's like, it's like the grace of heaven just arrested his heart. You ever been like that? Like, somebody cuts you off on the road in the car, and you go, grace. That's hard. It's hard. I, I've said this a few times. It's hard. That guy that did something to you 10 years ago, and he comes to mind, and you're like, is, can I show him some grace? This is actually the extension of the Father. If we want to walk like Jesus walked, we, we need to walk in more grace. We, we do. I mean. Now, I was thinking about this, too, the other day. We've heard of this term, sloppy grace. Have you heard that term? That term, sloppy grace. You got too much grace, too sloppy. Well, I was thinking about that, and I thought, there's actually no such thing as sloppy grace. If it's biblical grace, it actually calls you higher it doesn't, it doesn't celebrate you in your sin and your stuff. That's not sloppy grace. That's just sloppiness. So grace, biblical grace is actually a great thing. It is something that, like I said, we understand mercy. It's just easier to understand for me anyway. It's just easier to understand mercy. But grace is like, what unmerited favor? Why in the world, God, are you doing this for this guy? He's just a terrible human being. Why? Do you know that? If Hitler received Jesus before he died, guess what? He's in heaven. That doesn't make sense. It's unmerited favor. It's the grace of God. It's not up to us. It's up to him. Bible says, if you come unto him, if you receive him, if you call on his name, actually the Bible says in the, in the last days, those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what it says, if you want to be theologically correct. If you call on his name, just call on his name, you'll be saved. Doesn't say you have to give the Lord, do the Lord's, you know, a sinner's prayer. Doesn't say you have to look like this or dress like this or go to this church. It literally just says, if you call on the name of the Lord in the last days, those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So your worst enemy that you despise, he could call on the name of the Lord on his deathbed and guess what? He's with you in eternity. Why? For God's grace. But guess what? The only reason you're there with him is because of the grace of God. I do feel a preach on. Sometimes I just feel a preach on. I don't, I don't know why. It's because Jordan opened it up. And Jordan is a walking preacher. I'm, all right. Let's get back to the text. I'm going to put my glasses on because I barely read that. So he says, is there anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Verse 2, now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the, so now he was previously in Saul's house, but we believe um, he was now operating in David's house because he got one king's, um, he wasn't related to King Saul, but usually there's a transfer uh, often of people that from one 
kingdom to the next, and they bring them in as long as they, they're you know, trustworthy. So Ziba was probably, scholars say, was serving David's kingdom now, but David has a big kingdom. He did not know who this was, so he's like, is there anybody in, in the house of Saul that, that I can show kindness to? And David's servants say, there is a guy, Ziba, who used to serve with Saul, so they bring him into David, and David says to him, are you Ziba? And he says, I am your servant. The king said, is there no, is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness, to show the kindness of God? Oh, I know what I was going to say. I know what I was going to say. Tolerance is not grace. The spirit of tolerance is never found in Jesus. That's not grace. I hate the word tolerance. Be tolerant. Yeah, it's not. Instead of be tolerant, have grace. Again, grace will call you higher. Tolerance will agree with you in your garbage. That's okay. Just let it. When we let tolerance into the church, we're in big trouble. Big trouble. Tolerance is not a spirit of of, of, of the king. It's not a spirit of God. It's not, it's not an attribute of heaven. Anyway. So he brought Ziba in. He said, is there anyone in the house of Saul whom, whom I show kindness to? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. Interesting that Ziba decided to point out the flaw in him. He didn't even say his name. There, it doesn't say, well, there is a, a, a man named Mephibosheth nailing it there's a man named Mephibosheth who is living in a land no he said there's a dude no name but he's crippled he is Jonathan's son but he's crippled he's handicapped and let me tell you something now if you're handicapped it's like way better than what it was we celebrate it like it's okay we we, we embrace we like it's good we've turned as a society like we embrace that we're not like they're not freaks right that's good. Back then, it was, whoa, that meant something that you're cursed or you were outcast or you were something. So he's saying to the king, yeah, there is somebody, but seriously, he's an outcast. He's a cripple. He's like, like, seriously. But he is the son of Jonathan. There's always a Zeba pointing out your stuff. Like, I didn't ask about that. Zeba. Don't be a Zeba. So the king said to him, where is he? Zeba said to the king, behold, he is in the house of Machir, or Machir, the son of whoever in, <laughs> this is, come on guys, in Lodabar. I preached this sermon four years ago, August 2020. I had only taken, I'd been, I'd taken over the church a few months earlier. We had just gone out of COVID and uh, there were about 35 people in our church. So I figured I'm going to preach the message again. So that's why I'm, I'm doing it again. But if it was anybody here for the uh, August 2020 and heard this message? Lodabar. So it says he's in, he's, he's in Lodabar, which is about 70 or 80 miles from Jerusalem. So he's, he's, he's not, he's far away, and he's in, he's in anonymity. Lodabar means wilderness or barrenness. And Mephibosheth means from the mouth of shame. So there is son of Jonathan, grandson of Saul, living in anonymity and shame in a barren wasteland. And you want me to bring him here. The kindness of a king. So King David sends, he sent his chariot and brought him from the house that he was living in Lodabar. Could you imagine? He's trying to be, you know, uh, I'm over here in Lodabar. I'm 80 miles away. I mean, by donkey, that's probably a long, a long drive, right? And um, 
all of a sudden, the king's chariot pulls up in front of his home, and he's like, whoops, they found me. I'm a dead man. Could you imagine? I mean, just like the, if, in your mind, it, just as a story, think of it as a storyteller, and they come in, and they knock on his shack or whatever, and they say, the king has called for you. He's like, oh, great. So he gets it. He, he cripples himself in there, walks in there as a cripple would. I mean, it's, this is an important part of the story that we know he was crippled. And he gets in there, and for 80 miles or five days, however long it takes, he's sitting there, probably not five days. He's sitting. Don't correct me, people. Some people want to correct me. It just, just it doesn't matter how long it took. It's 80 miles. I get a text later. It was 72. I don't care. And the whole time, could you imagine what he's thinking? I'm dead. It does say he had one, one son. He's probably thinking, my, my child's going to be without a father. So he gets to the king's temple or whatever. And it says he presents himself to David. Either they carried him in or he's just clopping away, you know. And he gets to the king and guess what the king says, the very first words out of his mouth? Do not fear. How many times have you heard the Lord tell you in a situation, don't fear? Don't fear. It says, verse 7, David goes, I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And then he says this. He, he goes, not only do I not want you to be afraid, I'm telling you something. This is grace. I am restoring everything we have taken from your grandfather, and I'm giving it to you for the sake of your, your father, Jonathan. And he says, you will now eat at my table. Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth. Yeah, there it is. He responds, I am as a dead dog. How could you show kindness to me? I'm a dead dog. And he says, not only are you not a dead dog, not only are you getting all of your grandfathers who tried to kill me, I'm giving you all of his things. And Zeba, he looked at Zeba, he says, you will now, you and all your sons will serve him. And then he says this. To me, this is, this is like super key. Not only will you come and eat at my table, you will eat at my table as one of my own sons. This is the kindness of the king. You think you've messed up. You're living in shame. Maybe there's been something that your grandfather or your father or your mother did. And you're just trying to hide out until glory comes. Until you get to heaven. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I'm pulling you out of Lodabar. I'm calling you. I'm sending my chariot. And I'm saying, come out of the wilderness. Come out of shame. You will sit at my table as my son, whom I am proud of. Receive the grace of a loving king. And so could you imagine... J.D., you can come up. J.D., where's J.D.? J.D., J.D., hat man, man with a hat. J.D., here we go. Can you imagine the first time he shows up for that dinner? Whoo! King David comes in, 
And all of a sudden, <laughs> here comes David's kids. Here comes Absalom. And he sits down. And here comes another Here comes Solomon. And then, guess what? You can hear him coming down the hall. Clickety-clack, here comes the cripple. Here comes the cripple. And they must be looking at him like, what is he doing here? And David's like, he will eat with us as one of us. And he sits at the table, and the king's kingly tablecloth wraps over his legs and covers his past so that at the table of God, you can't even recognize he's a cripple anymore. I, if not for God's grace. So I just want you to open your hearts to the grace of God. Sit at his table. And let him cover your shame. Completely remove it from you. Could you stand with me? Uh, we'll have the uh, ministry team come up. I don't know. I felt something on this. I was a couple of weeks ago. I was like, I'm going to do this sermon again. And I kind of battled this week with it. Oh, I should do something else. And, and then I was like, no, I woke up. I'm like, last time, I'm like, no, we got to do the grace thing. Because, you know, we're, in our church, we are, we stand really strong for integrity and purity and righteousness. And we, we you know how we are. We don't, we're, we're not, we don't bow to Baal in this church. But I don't want you to get, I don't want it to be misconstrued when we're speaking of purity and we're calling you higher. I don't want you to forget about the most important thing in all of that, which is the grace of God that allows you to do that. If, if, if not for his grace. So sometimes we need to be reminded that God covers our past. He covers our club feet our barrenness, the king's robe covers and not just covers in the new covenant, he removes it. So I would say if the story was spoken in the new covenant, the cripple, as soon as he sits under the table, he is now healed. And so we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to release that's the wrong term he's already released it we're going to ask you guys to receive his grace so just take just close your eyes take 30 seconds and just say I receive your grace in your own way come on it's his grace L listen in the story the chariot went to him the, he, he sent his chariot to the barren place Mephibosheth didn't say, no, I'm going to stay here. I probably couldn't have by law, but he didn't fight it. He didn't say, no, you're going to have to kill me or drag me. I'm staying in my shame. I'm staying in my past. I'm staying in my junk. I'm staying in anonymity. No, he didn't. He said, the grace of God, the king is here. I am receiving it, and I am going to move forward, not stay in barrenness. That's the key. Don't stay where you're not supposed to be. Go 
where the King is and receive the grace of the King. In Jesus' name, amen.